all you upstart entrepreneurs hear me right now when I say, this is how real money works. What you build your self-esteem around matters a lot because it's going to influence how you behave. There's a power of when somebody tells you you can do something or they kind of challenge you that kind of pushes you, like it pushed me. But you have to believe what I call the only belief that matters. That if I put time and energy into getting better, I will actually get better. So like you pushing your dad saying, what do you mean this is not for us? Like, can't I get good enough at whatever game needs to be played that I can have the mansion, that I can have the Ferrari? And it's the people that then enter into that stream of self-improvement that end up winning. But if you don't believe you can get better, you won't even try, which means you won't, which means you'll be stuck forever. So the one of the poorest periods of my adult life was the beginning of Quest. And on paper, I was worth millions of dollars and I was bumming rides off of my employees. So everybody that gets pissed that Jeff Bezos is making more during quarantine, let me say this, it's not like he has that cash in his bank. Okay, he has to sell a piece of his company to then have that. And if you don't have to sell a piece, do you recommend don't sell it until you absolutely have to sell a piece? And people need to, one, always build a company for value creation. Don't build it to sell. And then if you want to exit it, by all means, but don't make the moves for the exit. Make the moves to build a really robust company that will survive long after you're gone. And if you're asking whether you should sell, the answer is yes. And if, if there is a, a great opportunity, take it, man. You will be shocked how hard it is to, like if, if you've got a lot of momentum behind you and a valuation that you're excited about, take it right? So you, nothing is guaranteed in the future. And if you can get something now and that feels like a total win for you, do it. Did you ever feel like you were going to get a, you were like borderline heart attack or did you ever feel like quitting? Did you ever feel like this is the end? Not even once. I felt like that before. Remember, I go into this because I quit. So Quest was structured to be fun in and of itself. The right question to ask is, what would I do and love every day even if I were failing. Hey, so I'm here with a really special guest, uh, Tom Bilyeu, uh, founder of Quest Nutrition. I know you sold the company for a lot of money, uh, but First off, Tom, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate this. It's like a, it's like a dream come true, you know, uh, to have you face to face and learn from you. My whole purpose of my podcast is to help and teach other entrepreneurs, especially millennials, because I'm a mill I barely made the millennial uh, age group, and a lot of us, you know, we grow up with technology and we think it's going to be so easy and you could create this uh, special lab that's going to make you a millionaire and then you're going to go from there. But um, you did it, um, like you built a company and, and you got it to multiple billions and sold it. And what surprises me or what I'm really, actually what I really respect from you is that even though you don't have to do any of this, like you could... You have you have so much wealth that you could be in an island just relaxing with your wife. Uh, you don't have to help people. You know you don't have to have the impact theory. You don't have to be that involved with uh, helping, and but you still do it. So it's really it really means a lot to me, and I'm sure that a lot of the entrepreneurs um, out there watching this are gonna appreciate this. And let me tell you a little bit about my audience. Uh, what makes me a bit different is uh, I was talking uh, with Ed Milet about this. Is that my 80% of my audience are Latinos, Hispanics. And 80% and of my, and my audience are male and uh, millennials. So I feel like me growing up, I was always told, you can't do this. This is not for you. You can't start a business. Uh, people that look a certain way, those are the only people that are going to be successful. You have no, no room here. Like you, you go, you know, get your college degree and go, go get a job. And I was told that over and over growing up. So because of people like you and reading these books, watching these podcasts, it gave me hope. And now that I, that, I, that I did it, I started my company. And then last year was after six years of battling heart attacks when I started my first company, like losing sleep because my wife is pregnant and I don't know how I'm going to cut payroll Friday. Just a lot of pain, you know. And 
after these six years, finally last year having a breakthrough and uh, hitting eight figures, the first year I, I hit eight, eight figures, I know that's just the beginning, but now I see like next year I want to hit, tw this year uh, we're going to hit 20 million. Next year we want to do 40 million. I want to get to 100 million. Then, then years from now, I want to get to that billion mark. So um, I'm just really driven. I'm really excited, but uh, I want to thank you first before we get started. And having said that, Tom, uh, just if you could uh, just introduce yourself a little bit and tell people who is Tom. And, and also, I want to make this a little bit different from your previous interviews and kind of uh, get some, some I'm going to try really hard to get things that you haven't uh, shared in the, in the past. So having said that, Tom, Hi, welcome, Hi, welcome Hi, here. Bro. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Tom. Yeah. So the background you, you touched on. So one of the founders of impact theory, uh, or sorry, one of the founders of quest nutrition, and now one of the founders of impact theory. Um, and it all started for me. I wanted to be a filmmaker and I had met these two very successful entrepreneurs. And I said, look, dude, you're coming to the world with your handout. And if you want to control the art, you have to control the resources. So why don't you come with us and get rich? And I thought that sounds amazing. I was already hell bent to get rich anyway. So I thought, yeah, let's do it. And I thought it would take 18 months, you know, go build a tech company real fast, uh, cash out for the billion dollars and, you know, just call it a day and go make my movies. And uh, it didn't quite work like that. It took 15 years, but in the end, we actually were successful and we had an exit. It wasn't, it wasn't sadly for multiple billions, but it was for a billion. Um, and, you know, it was just, um, it was a crazy thrill ride of ups and downs and having to become a certain person in order to pull it off. And so I'm not overly proud, I'll say, of the, the tangible success, but what I am very proud of is becoming the person I had to become, building the skill set that I needed to build in order to pull that off. So the way that I always explain it to people is don't worry about winning a championship, but focus obsessively on becoming capable of a championship performance. And if you focus on that, the skill acquisition, then things get really interesting. So um, that's me in a nutshell. Impact Theory Now is the media studio that I was trying to build in the beginning um, when I realized that I didn't have the capital to finance it. So everything comes full circle. That's awesome, Tom. And before we get into Impact Theory, when you started uh, your, your uh, company, um, Quest Nutrition, was it only you or did you have other co-founders? And how does somebody like you even think of that? Because I know your SAT wasn't the highest. Uh, you didn't grow up being the smartest student. Uh, how did that Tom that wasn't the smartest kid in school create this empire? Billion dollars is a big number. So how, how, how does that happen? So let's tease out. There's a few questions in there. So first, I was not the only one. Um, there were three of us that founded the company. How we came up with the idea is, is messy. So it's easy to... Um, to tell things in sort of a mythological way where you simplify things down to something that's followable, but I'll give you some of the messiness. So um, this is, I, I had been working with those guys. So first they just hired me, right? This is the whole come get rich moment. Um, they bring me on as a copywriter, but they're like, don't think of yourself as a copywriter. Think of yourself as a partner in the company and you really can become an owner if you perform at that level. And so I took them seriously, put my head down and just thought I have to get good at this. And I was very bad in the beginning. I have no natural business instincts. I am not a born entrepreneur. And, but just really believed that I could get better, right? And so a lot of that is an echo of learning about neuroscience and a growth mindset and all that. Um, but to keep it about founding the company. So I worked my way up to being uh, um, one of the owners of that technology company and was just so unhappy and got tired of chasing money, went in and quit, gave my equity back. I was like, look, I'm not going to cross the finish line. So it was about $2 million worth of equity, gave it back. And I said, I need to go do something that makes me feel alive. And so that ends at the it ends up being one of the most important things in terms of founding quest ever. But at the time it was just shame. I just felt like I was giving up. Um, but I just wasn't prepared to be unhappy like that anymore. Cause I didn't care about the product or anything. What was the main uh, thing that was making you unhappy? Cause you have $2 million on the table. Money. Just, just chasing money, man. And here, like, here's the punchline. Life 
unfortunately, is not about uh, money. It's not about fame. It's not about wealth. The only thing that matters, truly, 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 I wish people could just take me at my word for it and didn't have to suffer the way that I did. But the only thing that matters is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself. So that you're, you feel good about who you are, what you're striving towards. It's about becoming something, not being something. Um, it's just that is the physics of being a human. And so the human has innate drivers. And one of those innate drivers is improvement. Um, passion is about energy. So you, I don't want to derail us on how to build a passion. But anyway, when you build a passion, it gives you a lot of energy. So I didn't have that passion. So I didn't have that energy. But I had experienced that in filmmaking. I knew how good that felt and just wanted to get back to feeling that way. Um, and in quitting, I said, like, look, I, I'm not passionate. I don't love what I'm doing. I want to go do something that gives me more energy than it takes, um, that is authentically me, like all these things. And the guys who um, ended up co-founding Quest with me said, we actually feel the same. And so um, if we don't hit certain revenue metrics six months from now, um, would you still work with us if we sold this company and started something new? And what would that need to be? And so we brainstormed and blah, blah, blah. And so the way that it goes from just anything but this to specifically Quest Nutrition was the three of us saying, you know, what would we be able to be passionate about? Where could we add a ton of value? What could be a big business? That was still a big part of what we were asking. What do we care about naturally so that, you know, this could really be something that aligns with our selfish desires. And I had a partner who was way into nutrition and he had helped me transform my own life from a diet and exercise perspective. And so I was like, man, if we can leverage that, that would be amazing. He wanted to do something in food. We knew that if you could build a business on a product that people ate, like you're, you know, you're in a good place because people are going to come back and back and back. And so because I grew up in a morbidly obese family, I thought, man, if we can make food that people choose based on taste, and it happens to be good for them, I could show up every day and fight for that. And that was really important to me, that it was something that added value, that I had an emotional connection to, that I could be authentic, that I could lift people up, build community, all things that mattered to me. And then if it was, if we ended up failing, it would be okay because I would love the process and I would be fighting for somebody that I cared about. And that was ultimately how it became food and then ultimately how it took the specific manifestation of Quest. Now those Quest cookies, the the, the Quest cookies are, are so good. I don't know if you had. Uh, are you still involved with with Quest in some no, way? No, man. We told we we sold it, so we are we are all out. Um, I left about th four years ago now, so left four years ago. Sold about a year ago, uh, maybe a little less, and um, have no involvement whatsoever. It's still cool, obviously, you know, to see your child out there thriving and doing well. Um, but day-to-day -day operationally, no. But we did the cookies when I was still there. Oh, awesome. So thank you for those cookies because I, I eat two cookies a day. <laughs> so it keeps me, it keeps me, it keeps me healthy. I, I, like the, I like to stay low on carbs because I feel more energized. And I think it's as good as it gets to eating a cookie and having like kind of a cheat meal or something, but it's not that bad. But when you started Quest, uh, Tom, how much money did, did Tom and, his co and the other two co-founders have? Like, uh, how, were you guys super prepared for it? Well, financially, no. So it, when we first started it, it was bootstrapped entirely. So we, I think we got profitable with about $10,000 investment. Um, and so it didn't take a lot of upfront money, but then about a year into Quest, we sold our previous company and my two partners then did have enough money for us to buy the equipment. Um, and I leveraged my house. So I took out, well, I used my um, house to guarantee, personally guarantee the loans. So in that sense, we had just enough where we didn't have to go and raise capital, but we were really thrifty because we were direct to consumer. So this wasn't, you know, we didn't go to retail first, we were online. So we were getting paid right away. So we were able to cash flow our way to a big business. And that's something that, you know, I think is an important lesson for entrepreneurs. You don't have to raise capital, you have to get sales. And so we focused on sales. And so it really was the velocity of sales that allowed us to grow the business to the point where we could then go to a bank and say, hey, look, 
we've got this product, it's growing like crazy. We want to go to retail, but now we're going to need to cash flow that. So there's going to be, you know, a pretty big, and we're growing so fast, there's going to be a pretty big outlay and then say, you know, a three to four month wait before we're recouping that money. But a bank, when they're seeing the kind of growth that we had, it was just crazy and it was sustained and we'd been doing it. By the time we went to the banks, we'd probably been doing it for 18 to 24 months. So we had a track record. We had built a previous business. We, um, you know, we're, we had some collateral that we could put up on, our, on um, against the, the loans. It was all just growth capital. So it was pretty easy to make a case um, and get the, you know, sort of accounts uh, receivable um, loans from the bank. And, and so we were able to cash flow everything without having to raise capital. And what you said right now is a big example of courage. Like I, I really understand that and love what you just said about focusing on sales. And then you make sales, now you have money to keep growing. Why do you think, and you're really big on mindset. Why do you think most people, they want to wait till they have everything perfect and they have a lot of reserves and, and they just never take action? Uh, how, why do people just not commit and then make those sales and, and, and go for their dreams? Why do you think people... That, that's really multifaceted. So the biggest problem is that if you don't try, then you don't fail. And because it really is what you think about yourself and you're by yourself, people know that a, a failure is very emotionally expensive. And if you try something and you built your self-esteem around being right or smart or talented or any of those very fragile things, if you fail, then you really will feel badly about yourself. And so it is very protective to not even try. So part of my core message is what you build your self-esteem around matters a lot because it's going to influence how you behave. So it just so happened that I had switched what I built my self-esteem around probably seven or eight years before we launched Quest to being the learner. And so it was a willingness to try, a willingness to stare nakedly at my inadequacies, to accept where I was weak, to try to improve myself and to value myself for my willingness to do that. Not my ability to accomplish greatness, but my willingness to strive, my willingness to go all out to become. Not that I actually achieve it, that's so important, but that I was willing to say, oh, I really am bad at that. Oh, I really don't have entrepreneurial instincts. Oh, I'm gonna have to cultivate all this stuff. I'm gonna have to learn business. I'm not one of those cool kids that like was selling you know, people's flowers back to them. Like you hear all these great stories um, about people go and rip flowers out of some somebody's yard and then sell them back. I wasn't clever like that. I didn't have guts like that. So it was recognizing, oh, courage is something I'm actually going to have to build. Oh, emotional fortitude is something I have to build. I didn't come pre-equipped with that. Okay, well, cool. If that's what I need to do, then I'm going to do it. But because my self-esteem, the very thing that I get proud over is my willingness to go. I'm not courageous by default. I must develop courage. Like, not even developing the courage, my willingness to say I need to, and then to really try with everything I have every day, that is what I value myself for. Now, it just so happens if you do that, you actually will develop courage, you will get better at business, but that isn't what I pride myself on. I don't pride myself on what I've become, I pride myself on how hard I try to become better. Now, just quick question, Tom, uh, based on the internet, I look you up and it says the, a Tom worth uh, half a billion dollars, more or less. Uh, it could be off, um, maybe it's more. But um, a person like you, do you still get mentorship? Do you still do self-improvement? Every day. <laughs> Here, here's the thing, burn this into your soul. Your current skill set has already taken you as far as it's going to take you. So if you want to get somewhere new, you've got to learn something new. So yeah, I'm, I am literally every day trying to get better at something. So if you count books and authors as mentors, then yes, I am mentored every single day. And with like, man, you say that your audience is millennials. Let me tell you, millennials, embrace, embrace YouTube. The fact that you can learn from people for free in every discipline is fucking crazy. Yeah. And I, I take so much advantage of that. So I read every day, between reading and by reading, I mean audiobooks. So I'm an audible guy exclusively. Oh, yeah. I don't, yeah, I never do physical books just because I, I can't get the information fast enough. But between audiobooks and YouTube videos, I probably clock about two hours a day, every day, seven days a week uh, of learning something new. So that I am relentless on that. 
Do you have a day where you kind of take off, relax, have some beers or, or chill or, or is it at seven days? Um, I definitely do days where I think about work priorities differently. So yeah. my mantra is Monday through Friday, if I'm awake, I'm either working or working out. Then on the weekends, I still clock probably about six hours of, of true work a day. But then, I mean, that leaves you 18 hours for the day where I'm not, right? And if I sleep eight, which I don't, I normally sleep six. So that still leaves me a gaggle of hours to, you know, just goof off and have fun with my wife, play video games, you know, whatever the case may be. So I work probably what most people would consider an uncomfortable amount. Um, so I clock in an average week, I'm probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 hours uh, with routine punctuations up to 100 plus hours. Um, and then, and that doesn't include like the learning stuff, but it, it doesn't feel like that. The goal is to do something that where so much of what is technically work is something you love and would want to be doing anyway. So for instance, Impact Theory being a media company, we're writing comic books, we're, you know, movie scripts, stuff like that. And so work for me oftentimes is creating a whole new world, creating characters, writing something, working with other writers. Um, and, and I love that and did that, you know, even when nobody was paying me for it. So um, that's part of the key. Yeah. Do you consider work life and like life work? Yeah, I don't. I mean, look, it, I think that people need to be very careful. There have been times in my life where I would damage my marriage and you need to know what your priorities are. You need to structure your life in a very intelligent way, but making clear delineations between work and what you love is probably not ideal. So for instance, my wife is my business partner, was even part of the founding team back at Quest. So we've been working side by side for uh, more than a decade now. So that, that is part of what makes it amazing is I'm not being pulled away. I don't have kids, so that makes it really easy. Um, and I am so passionate about what I do that it wouldn't matter whether I was making money or not. I would be spending a significant amount of my time every as um, uh, I, I can't believe I'm blanking on Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos. As Jeff Bezos says, every business, no matter how much you love it, has overhead. There are things that you don't enjoy doing. And, and that for sure is true for me. Um, but that is, there's a delineation in my life between what I like and what I don't like, but not so much between work and play. Yeah. And speaking about your wife, uh, my wife also works with me. So I see her all day long. So I wake up with her. We have fun together. We work out together. And then we work in the office together. And, you know, sometimes... She feels like choking me and, and I feel like uh, I can't choke her, but I, I could do other things. But, but like your, your wife, uh, Lisa, uh, can you talk about a little bit about of when you met her, uh, how it happened? Because I know that she's um, really important in your life. And uh, how did you meet Lisa and how did it grow to where you are today? How is it working with her? Uh, well, it's amazing working with her because she is is the most extraordinary business partner I've ever had. Like she is unreal. And I've I've worked with some literally Hall of Fame entrepreneurs, but she's just on another level, man. She's really, really incredible. Um, the way that, what was the first part of the question? Like, like how did you meet her? Like, did you meet her when oh, you, right, meet her. Yeah, yeah, did yeah, you already have Quest yeah, Nutrition? Did you have Quest Nutrition already or not yet when you oh, met her? No, no. I was, I was the brokest of broke people when my wife met me. Can you talk um, about that? Yeah, of course, man. So I was teaching. She was my student. It was a school for adults. I feel compelled to mention that. She'd already graduated college. Um, but she came to America for a really short course. And I thought, this is perfect. She is legally obligated to leave the country. And she has seen me at my best because um, teaching is something that um, I really love doing and uh, I have high verbal ability. So it's, it's certainly an area where I've historically shined. So that was uh, a wonderful way to meet somebody for me. And we just hit it off and both thought it was going to be a fling and that she would go back to London and that would be that. And I had been, I was planning to move to New York. And so I'd been saving up money and time off um, to go to New York just to make sure that I actually liked it. And instead of doing that, I got my passport and I went to London to spend like 10 days with her. And on the flight home, I realized, oh man, this sucks. I'm in love with her. And so now what? She lives in London. I live in LA. I can't fly back and forth. I can't afford it. So what do we do now? And through the world's most bizarre set of circumstances, she ended up coming to America. I ended up getting work in London with the company that I was already working for in America. It was fucking crazy. Um, 
and yeah, just allowed us to let the relationship blossom. And we took it very seriously from, you know, the moment we realized we were in love and just were really smart about building a super strong foundation. So we've been together now. We've been together for 20 years. Uh, we've been married for 18. So it's, uh, you know, we, we've, we've got some credibility these days in terms yeah, yeah. of making it last. But, um, you know, it, it's been the most extraordinary gift of my life is meeting that woman. She, she's my number one priority in no uncertain terms. Nothing measures up to her. Not the business, not the success, nothing. Yeah. Without so, so how is it? Uh, like, how did you propose to her, or, or how did you guys, um, like, uh, when did you know, like, oh, it because it, you knew her for twenty years, you've been married for eighteen years, so two years. Uh, it took you two years to kind of uh, propose to her, or, or how, how? Oh, it took it took us two years to actually walk down the aisle. A little less, actually. Um, no, I proposed after eight months. So I broke a lot of rules. I don't advise people to get, especially guys, don't get married in your 20s, um, which I did. Got married at 26. Uh, don't propose to somebody who you haven't lived with, which I did. Don't uh, propose unless you've been together for at least a year, which I violated that. So basically every rule that I have, I was sort of a, a walking violation of, but it, the hard part was proposing. I really, really thought about that. And before I met her, I didn't plan to get married. So when she came in like a whirlwind and I realized, okay, wait a second. Um, it became clear to me, I was either ne never getting married or I was going to marry her. And once I had that realization, I thought, okay, you know, let's think about all her flaws, all the things that are problematic. And am I okay? Never sleeping with another woman again and dealing with these problems. Does all of that add up for me? And it did. And so once I decided to propose, that was it for me. Walking down the aisle was not nerve wracking, nothing. By then I was chomping at the bit to get married. And it was, it was just really being thoughtful about was this the person that I wanted to propose to? But once I proposed, I, I closed the door and was completely committed and, and just have never looked back. Because I'm, I'm sure that you guys were in love and you guys wanted to get married. But, but uh, for people that don't know the story about uh, her dad, can you talk about uh, how, you, how you asked him and, and how, what happened there? Yeah, so my wife is, uh, she grew up Greek and, well, she is Greek, but grew up with a very like OG Greek Orthodox father. And I knew that if I didn't ask for his blessing, uh, that I'd be in real trouble. Now I knew better than to ask for his permission because I thought he would say no, but I thought he would give me his blessing to be honest. Uh, and so I went and um, unbeknownst to my then girlfriend, uh, didn't tell her I was going to propose, didn't tell her I was going to ask him, went and asked and he said, no, uh, he did not give me his blessing. He did not want me to marry his daughter. And uh, I was in a really tough spot because I was like, look, I hear you. I respect your answer. Um, but just so you know, I am going to propose to your daughter in the next couple of days. So please don't tell her, uh, which he didn't. He was, he was very cool. And look, my father-in-law has always been extraordinarily kind to me. He just wasn't bashful about saying, I don't want you guys to get married. Um, you know, he just thought we didn't have enough in common. Um, I had not proven myself. And his big question to me was, you know, look, my daughter's become used to a certain lifestyle. And yeah. how do you plan to take care of her? Because he's, he's very successful. Um, and worked his way up from abject poverty, abject poverty, dude, like crazy, grew up in the mountains, backwoods, like the American equivalent would be growing up in, in Appalachian mountains in Kentucky. No joke. Like the most backward of backward mountain villages, which is still, it's not a town, it is a cluster of houses in the middle of nowhere in a small island called Cyprus. And he went from that to running one of the largest shipping companies in the world. I mean, just this crazy story of ascendancy. So imagine this undereducated kid from another country coming and saying that he wants to marry your daughter. And he was just real about it. And he was like, how do you plan to take care of her? And I said, look, I know what you see is this undereducated kid broke. At the time, I didn't even have a job. Um, but I'm the most ambitious person you've ever met. And one day, this is a quote, one day I'm going to make your daughter rich. And uh, of course he was like, yeah, 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 sure. Whatever. Didn't buy it. And I'm sure I sounded like a dumbass. I given somebody giving me that same speech, I'd be like, no way. Just most people can't do it. And I had the ambition at the time, but it, I did not have the drive. And so the important thing to realize about my father-in-law is he wasn't wrong. 
I just ended up changing. But he, he accurately identified me. And part of what forced me to develop the drive was the promises I had made to my wife and not wanting my father-in-law to be right. And I think that having that um, hovering over my head, the sort of Damocles, as it were, of man, if you screw up, like, first of all, your wife is, you're going to have drug her down with you. And then your father-in-law is going to be like, I told you. So that, that really pushed me hard. Yeah, you know, when there's a power of when somebody tells you you can not do something or they kind of challenge you, that kind of pushes you like it pushed me. My dad was a painter. My dad's a painter. I mean, he still likes to paint, but he was a painter and we lived in the ghetto. So he used to take me to Beverly Hills with him to paint homes from uh, you're familiar with 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 L.A. So I used to live in Echo Park, uh, L.A. area. But back in, in my time, uh, we had drug dealing shootings. So it was a bad area. And we used to, I used to drive with him when I was six years old to Beverly Hills to help him paint. I wasn't really helping him, but I was just maybe more causing problems. But, but I saw the mansions and the red Ferrari. That's where everything started. And I asked my dad, like, how come you don't have this? And then he told me, well, it's not for us. And then I kind of challenged him, like, what do you mean? Like, like, why? And he said, well, if you work really hard and you never quit, maybe you'll have a shot at it. So, every, so that moment... At six years old, it changed my life because I, I got that. I became ambitious. I got that drive and I wanted to prove him like it is possible. And uh, like I said, like growing and listening to people like you that help you, give you clues. Did you ever have, uh, did you have a moment in life where, where it made you ambitious or were you ambitious from the start? How, how, do you, how do you become ambitious or is that something that you either have it or you don't? Do you know? I don't think anything is you either have it or you don't, but I do think that each of us get some things um, just from the jump. So um, science has shown that we're roughly 50% are genetic, so hardwired, you just are what you are, and then 50% is, is completely malleable. And the one thing I will say, I don't remember ever acquiring, so I will just assume that I was born with it, is ambition. I've always wanted more. I've always had an insatiable drive for better. Now, I was very frustrated um, by not being able to have the things that I wanted as a kid. I used to think that I grew up poor until I encountered what real poverty is. I did not grow up poor. Yeah. I grew up sort of lower middle class, um, but it's still given my sort of natural disposition, plus the fact that my parents couldn't get me the things that I wanted, plus having to do work that I hated doing and did not want to do as a kid. In my family, from the time I was 12, I always had summer work and then later in life worked year round. Um, I, I, there were certain jobs I knew I did not want. And it was just like this dream. I just so believed that I could be rich. And I, Am I mourn for kids that didn't get to grow up in the 80s. The 80s was a rad time to grow up in America. It just was, America was a superpower. It was, everyone was proud to be an American, man. And I was watching 80s movies, fucking yeah. Schwarzenegger, just like tearing up and down, you know, Van Damme, uh, yeah. Stallone. Like it was just badass after badass. And I just fell in love with that idea of like, I could become anything I wanted to be. And so when my parents told me that, I believed them. And so I just kept telling everybody, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be rich. And no one believed me because I was so lazy. But once I cracked the lazy nut and realized that ambition and drive are different and develop drive, then the rest took off. So I, I believe ambition is something you can develop. Drive, I know you can develop because I had to do it. Um, and so even something like passion is a process. And I think people should approach everything saying, well, if you want something more for your life, that's all the ambition you need to get started. One of the things you give hope to a lot of young, younger entrepreneurs that are coming up is you, you uh, make it clear that anybody, no matter who they are, can achieve huge levels of success. Because like you started and, and you, know, you, you weren't rich, uh, you weren't, you, your SAT score wasn't the best but you proved that you could build a billion dollar company. So let's say somebody that is born average, just, just, just to say it average, uh, you're saying that 50% of their success, it's in their control. 100%. Yeah, no what? question. This, like the way to think about it is um, people understand athletics. So if I told you, hey, a kid grew up in the inner cities, Echo Park, drug dealing, gunshots all day, every day, uh, best friend is killed in front of him, right? 
And I said, but he goes on to become one of the greatest NBA players of all time. Like take Isaiah Thomas, right? This is literally his story. And everybody gets that. And people don't bat an eyelash when you say that, you know, some ungodly number of people that end up in um, professional athletics grew up in poverty. And that's part of what gives them that energy to want to get out. And they see athletics as a way out. But yet people don't see that same thing with um, business. Business is just a set of skills. Now, like anything, some skills will come easier to some people than others. But that has nothing to do with where you're born and has everything to do with what you learn. Now, education obviously plays a huge role, but you can get educated at any age. So business, like basketball, one of my favorite quotes from Kobe Bryant is booze don't block dunks. Same thing is true of building a business. No matter how much people want to hate on you, if you create something that people want to buy, you've got a business. Yeah. Simple as. So now it's just a question of, have you been told your whole life, this is not for us? So I worked in the inner cities. I have a massive sweet spot for Latinos because so many of my employees were Latino at Quest. And so I really got a, a view into a world that up until that point, I didn't know a lot about. And I remember one kid coming up to me and saying, you know, my mom told me that the world doesn't want people like me to succeed. And I was like, what? Like, why would you ever say that? Like, even if you secretly worry that that's true, that doesn't empower that person. That, that stops them from even trying. Now, you may be coming from a good place where it's like, you don't want them to get their hopes up only to be dashed. But it's like, man, even if they end up failing, you want them to at least try. You want them to give everything and push that 50% as far as they can push it. And realizing that some of the most extraordinary people I'd ever met in my life, entrepreneurs far better than me by nature, were growing up in the inner cities and they were never going to do anything with their life because people were telling them crazy shit like the world doesn't want you to succeed. Which, by the way, first of all, who gives a shit if the world wants you to succeed? Dunk on them, man. Booze don't block dunks. You can do whatever you want. Like in business, nobody can stop you but you. Either you get good enough to build something that people want or you don't. It's that simple. It does not care what color you are. It does not care where you grew up. It doesn't care anything other than can you create something that's so valuable, people have to have it. It's that simple. Anybody that meets what I call minimum requirements can do that. Now, for sure, there are minimum requirements, but I promise you, if you listen to this podcast, you meet minimum requirements. So yeah. now it's a question of, are you gonna face the difficult, the gut-wrenching realities of the fact that you are not yet good enough? You're not. Like, I wasn't good enough when I started. I was a total moron. And I had to get better. But you're not going to get better until you truly acknowledge that you're a moron. This is a true story. And I don't know when I tell this that people realize I'm being dead serious. When I first started in business, the sole contribution that I would make to a conference call with a potential client or a vendor, anything, was to say goodbye at the end of the call. And I remember I could tell, ooh, we're wrapping up. We're about to do it. This is going to be the only thing I say in this entire call is goodbye. And I used to long for it because I felt like I was doing something. And I was just like, I'm not here to speak because I have nothing to say, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to learn and learn and learn relentlessly. I'm going to read every book, watch every, they didn't call them podcasts back then, but anything that I can get my hands on, if somebody's putting out information, I'm going to try to learn from it. And you get better over time. And so three years in, I'm starting to be a little less embarrassing. Five years in, I'm actually starting to be good. 10 years in, like I'm really cooking. And now 20 years into being an entrepreneur, I can actually build things. But man, that shit takes time. But you have to believe what I call the only belief that matters. That if I put time and energy into getting better, I will actually get better. So like you pushing your dad saying, what do you mean this is not for us? Like, can't I get good enough at whatever game needs to be played that I can have the mansion, that I can have the Ferrari? And it's the people that then enter into that stream of self-improvement that end up winning. But if you don't believe you can get better, you won't even try, which means you won't, which means you'll be stuck forever. Yeah, you know what I like to compare it to? Uh, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. Like Michael Jordan, you know how he has the huge hands? Kobe has smaller hands. Uh, Jordan has a vertical leap that's uh, outrageous. Kobe doesn't jump that high. I mean, he jumps high, but not like Michael Jordan. But one of the things that Kobe always talked about was uh, how hard he worked uh, before the game, after the game, how much he prepared, and uh, how much time he put into uh, his game that made it that made up for all the other stuff. And I and I know how that is because 
I'm not, I'm not the most gifted uh, man in the world. Uh, like, uh, I'm the opposite. Like, I have everything against me. I'm not supposed to make it in business. But I work harder than people that are way more talented than me. Like, when you mentioned two hours a day that you more or less do uh, to self-improve, when you were coming up, or, or let's say when, uh, when, you, you're, when you're in school and when, before you opened Quest Nutrition, when you're not that smart yet or you don't have all that information yet like you do now, were you also doing a lot of self-improvement back then? Or when did that start where you just said, you know what, I'm going to work my ass off to get better to learn more? Like, when did that start? It started in earnest in my mid twenties. So if anybody is listening to this and they feel like they're behind the eight ball, I've got employees that started with me when they were like 19. They're so much farther ahead of me at say 2021 20, than I was at 26 when I really started to take this seriously. It was probably when I was about 24 that I started cobbling together um, ideas around brain science, which was the huge breakthrough for me because Carol Dweck had not written the book Mindset yet. The internet didn't exist in any meaningful way. And getting a hold of this stuff was like Tony Robbins tapes was about the extent of it, Tony yeah. Robbins was so exciting to me, but I wasn't sure if I believed that I could actually get better. And when I started reading about the brain and realized there was this whole debate around something called brain plasticity, which is basically that even as you age, you can still learn something, that your brain will actually rewire itself to accommodate this new knowledge that you truly can improve. And it was being debated. Is it true? Is it not true? And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to act like it is true because that's so much more exciting. And it relieved me of this like depression that I had because I was, I was really sliding towards depression and I had no idea how to make my dreams come true. I had all this grand ambition and no idea how to execute. And that was really upsetting. And when I read that, it gave me a ray of hope. And it was like, okay, if I'm, if I'm just not good enough yet, if I'm just not smart enough yet, and I actually can on a long enough timeline get good at this, I'm willing to put in that work. And so that began, I mean, it is like a snowball. It wasn't like, oh, click, boom, now I'm you know, golden, I have a growth mindset and I'm ready to go. But it's like that notion gets planted somewhere around 24. I end up marrying my wife at 26. I've now got this, my, my wife is amazing. She, she is the epitome of behind every great man is a great woman. Like this woman is fucking fire. She is unbelievable. And she kicked my ass and pushed me because but at the beginning, she didn't plan to be an entrepreneur. Like she was just like, I'm married to this guy and he's going to go do his thing. And um, she was amazing and supportive and all that. So she worked through me to push me towards greatness. And that was powerful. My father-in-law's doubt was powerful. My own um, fears and anxieties of never amounting to anything were powerful. My willingness to be dissatisfied was powerful. And so you get this cocktail mixed with, I'm beginning to learn about the brain and then it just, it explodes from there because then it starts, you, you realize, whoa, one bit of knowledge stacks to the next bit of knowledge stacks to the next bit of knowledge. And you actually start getting good. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's very similar. It, she reminds me a lot of my wife because my wife, same thing. Like she met me, we started going out, we're having fun dating. And then I tell her like, you know what? I'm in mortgages and real estate. And then we're going to open a company. And then by just, uh, just automatically, she is forced to become my right hand because she's my girl and all I do is work. I wake up early and, and I work and I do self-improvement and, and then I go work out to f fix my mind a little bit and go back to work and keep working. So I'm doing everything. And like, what is there to do? Nothing. We just have to work. So she becomes uh, by force uh, the operations girl. So she runs operations. I'm, I'm the one, the, the leader, the CEO, uh, kind of making decisions and uh, thinking about innovative campaigns. What can I do? What's our next move? Uh, and then she's just running operation. And, and, and now she's become this, she's the brains of all the operations in the company. And she's really good at it, really good at it. But she, but she was thrown into it. Uh, at what point uh, do you think your wife, uh, Lisa, uh, started to like just take charge of, of being that powerhouse of an entrepreneur woman in your business? It literally sounds exactly like what your wife went through. So it was at Quest 
And at first it was just like, hey, you know, we've got a couple of orders we need to ship out. Is there any way that you could just do that real fast? Yeah, yeah, of course, no problem. And then it was like, wow, it's, you know, getting to be, we have orders every day. And then it's like, wow, we can't do this from our living room anymore. We've now got to move into a garage. And then it's like, oh my God, like this is really, we're growing. And hey, do you mind like, you know, we're going to move into a facility if you could, like that would be great because you just already know it. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, we should probably get you an employee. And then it's, you have 10 employees and then you have 40 employees under her. And it was just, she just kept saying like, you know, I, I've got to learn this. I've got to learn it. And she just knew she could learn. And so she just kept going and going and then began to really recognize that she was good at it, that she was willing to do the work, that she was improving by leaps and bounds. Um, and, and we, we had to really have a conversation because it was the death of the traditional, like I'm the breadwinner, I'm the entrepreneur, you're the housewife and became like, oh, like we're going to, you know, be, we're both going to be entrepreneurs and we're going to found something together. And um, it was tough because she was setting out my clothes, cooking all my meals, buying everything. Like, you know, things would just show up at the house. I never had to think about anything. She just sorted it all out. My gym clothes would be laid out. Clothes would be chosen. Like it was just, it was amazing. And it was wonderful to have that. But what I told her as she began to go through this transformation was I wouldn't be the man that I want to be if I didn't support you in becoming the woman that you want to become. So let's talk about it. Like, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? What do you want to become? And, and she just realized that she had really been bitten with the entrepreneurial bug and she wanted to go hard for it and was like, cool, let's, you know, let's get into this together. And because we were able to communicate through that and I could say out loud that I'm not excited now to have to make my own meals and set up my own clothes, but I'm hundred percent willing to do it because I know what you want. You've been very clear. You've articulated it. Um, and I want you to have the life you want to have. And having that dialogue and not making things taboo was very powerful. Yeah. To me, it seems like and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but it, like you might have some gaps. She might have some gaps, but together, both of you, you guys have no gaps. And yeah, it, it, like you said, having a CEO and a COO as a partnership is, is very powerful. Do you feel that uh, or going back, you're a single Tom. You don't marry Lisa. Do you think, uh, who are you without Lisa? Where are you today? Are you like partying like a rock star? Are you still rich? Uh, are you with a lot of different women? Like who's Tom right now? If Lisa, I think I have the answer to that. And I think everybody knows the answer to that. But uh, have you ever thought about what if uh, Lisa, uh, I would have never married her? I, I don't think a lot about that if I'm completely honest, but I will say I, and I, people may be surprised by this. I don't think that there are soulmates out there. So I think that um, I probably would have ended up meeting another person that had some of the same raw qualities that Lisa had. And, you know, we probably would have built an amazing relationship. Um, so that comes down to, I knew what I was looking for. I responded to it when I saw it. Um, I've invested in the relationship and high level communication and same with Lisa. Um, and so obviously because it is Lisa, I would never want to give that up. And as I tell her all the time, she never has to worry about me trading her in for a younger model because the only thing that really matters to me is a shared life. And we've shared a life for 20 years, man. I yeah. don't even know who I would be without her. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it because I'm not particularly interested. It's who, who we have become together is the thrill of my life. And I, I remember, I'm not a crier at all, but one day, I, I don't remember why I got so overcome with emotion, but I, I was crying, telling her the world will never understand how much of what I have achieved is because of you and how much you pushed me. And even trying to put words to it, it makes her sound mean and it wasn't mean. I just don't know how to accurately explain that she didn't ever let me off the hook. Like when I was feeling weak, she didn't make me feel bad or guilty, but she was like, fuck that. No, you're going to get up, keep going. Like you need to, you have a vision. You said you were going to do this and, and you're going to do this. And I'm right here with you and I'm going to support you. And, but there is no being lazy. There is no giving up like none of that. And the depth of gratitude that I have to have been pushed like that um, knows no bounds. Like it, it is truly, truly amazing. Um, and obviously I chose a woman like that. And she chose a man that would respond to that. So it's, you know, we are, we are at this point 
there's no way to untangle who we are as people. And Tom, do you guys ever have disagreements, fights? Uh, do you guys have like a relationship improvement dinner once a week? Or like, how is your, how do you guys uh, have those moments of passion, if I could say, or, or you know? We definitely fight, no question, still to this day. Um, we don't spiral out of control anymore. We did in our 20s, baby. We used to really fucking spiral. Uh, and we'd end up being mad for hours, sometimes until the next day. I don't think we were ever mad more than say 24 hours, but it was really assessing how dumb it was because I worked so much that it was really only Saturdays that we spent any time together in the beginning of our marriage to the point where I alluded to this earlier. She had, finally had to pull me aside and say, you're now damaging our marriage. You're just working too much. And at those times, every now and then we would lose an entire Saturday. The only day we were going to hang out, we would lose to me getting angry about something. And so I just, you know, approach things from a neuroscience perspective and looking at the way the brain works, looking at neurochemistry, um, looking at the studies on how to change your mood, um, came across a study that talked about how if you fake a smile, it will actually change your neurochemistry. And so I wrote a letter to myself because part of what would always make me resistant to letting go of whatever was making me mad was that I had a legitimate reason to be hurt, upset, offended, whatever I was. And she had a motive to try to calm me down because she didn't want to feel badly about whatever she had done that was, you know, a wrong. Because I'm not prone to get upset over little shit. I'm going to get upset over something that's real. You actually did something, even you would agree, that was problematic. So she would try to talk me down. I didn't want to let myself be talked down because I didn't trust her motives. And so I finally looked back and I wrote this letter and I said, look, hey, me, it's me. You have no ulterior motive other than you know you will look back on this and say, you wasted this time. So I want you to right now, even though you don't feel like it, I want you to laugh out loud and just laugh out loud for 30 seconds. And you will find that at the end of that, you're going to feel completely differently. And odds are that you're going to be very open to Lisa being, you know, conciliatory. And so I thought, okay, let me try it. She read the letter to me once. I laughed out loud. It was so ridiculous and so effective that I never, she never needed to read it to me again because I could change my neurochemistry, which is really what you have to do very, very quickly. And so investing in tricks like that, that truly acknowledge the human condition um, and what I want to get out of the relationship, knowing that my relationship is more important to me than my business and my business is critically important to me, was like, hey, if this really is that important, the least you can do is focus on changing your neurochemistry so you guys can come back together. And so while we do certainly disagree and running a business together, you're going to disagree quite often. Um, it's a great quote, which is if you both think alike, then one of you is unnecessary. So we thrive because there is friction between the ways that we view the world and that helps us in business. But that also means that we're going to have sometimes debates, sometimes arguments, sometimes outright fights, uh, yeah. but we're very good at, rapidly equalizing and getting back to neutral. Awesome. I, I know we have, um, I'm not sure, I think it was like an hour, so I want to respect your time. Uh, it's really getting good right now. I, I like what, what's coming up. I have a few more things. And then, but feel free, just kind of go like that or if, if you got to cut off. But I just, I, I just. I have a hard stop in like 12 minutes. Perfect, perfect. I'll close it out in 10. So, uh, Tom, going back to when you started uh, Quest uh, and, and then your wife, you're with your wife. Did he, how when did you start making money where you were like, okay, I made a million or I have a million in the bank or I could go and buy this exotic car or I could go buy this million dollar home or when did you really feel like I, I have some good money? Like how long did it take? It took a very long time. So this, this is like all you upstart entrepreneurs hear me right now when I say this is how real money works. So I was making a fine income when we were at our technology company. It was nothing thrilling, but absolutely fine. I could pay bills and I wasn't panicking about money any way, shape or form. Then I cut my money down to, I was making 50K at the start of uh, Quest. So two people in Los Angeles on 50K, that is you do not leave the house. You do not do anything. We sold one of our cars. We had one car. It was a beat up Ford Focus with a leaky exhaust. When you accelerated to over 50 miles an hour, it would rattle. It was hilarious. And I had to bum rides off my own employees because I had everything in trying to build the company. And because of the way that growth works, growth is the surest way to remain broke. You might have a lot of 
equity, but you don't have money in the bank. So the, one of the poorest periods of my adult life was the beginning of Quest. And on paper, I was worth millions of dollars and I was bumming rides off of my employees. So everybody that gets pissed that Jeff Bezos is making more during quarantine, let me say this, it's not like he has that cash in his bank. Okay, he has to sell a piece of his company to then have that. So that's why these values fluctuate, you know, from one minute to the next. Anyway, I think people fundamentally misunderstand how like net worth, which is totally unfucking interesting, net worth is very different than money in the bank. Okay. So I had high net worth, no money in the bank. So it was like a very, it was a fun time. It was a great time. It was beautiful. I'm all about enjoying what each like part of the cycle brings every phase, enjoy every phase. And it was awesome, man. We were fucking grinding. We were working so hard, but it was like the most diehard motherfuckers ever. This is when I had, we put out on the, on the street, we will consider people for employment, even if they have felony convictions. We had the most crazy motherfuckers working for us, but they were hardcore because they had hope for the first time in their lives. It was awesome. So even though I was poor and driving this shitty beat up car, it was still rad. And I would take people with me and I would drive them up into Beverly Hills and be like, you need to learn to dream. This is where I developed my ambition was I would drive, sounds like you going with your dad. I would drive around, look at the big houses. And I wouldn't say, fuck these guys. They have something I don't. I would say, what do I have to do to get it? And so I was trying to get people amped up about that. Anyway, so it's years into Quest, probably about two years into Quest. And now I'm finally like, pulling a salary again. And then I'm like, whoa, like I can actually pull a stipend for a car. So now I have a Mercedes and I'm like, holy shit, this is crazy. I'm driving a Mercedes. And then I think what, five years into the company, then, then it was legit on paper. I was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And we finally then sold a piece. And this is when I realized what money really is. So I go, I have, I'm doing fine. I'm driving my Mercedes. I'm, you know, I don't have to worry about money again. I'm very happy doing good salary, but it's a normal sort of middle-class salary. And then we hit the point where we pull money out of the company and we sell a very small percentage, but at a over a billion dollar valuation, even a very small percentage is a lot of raw dollars. And I'm sitting there hitting refresh on my banking app because I know the money's going to be wired. And I go from sort of normal bank account to a lot of commas and zeros. And it was so crazy because in that moment, I could now buy anything I wanted, including an island. And in that moment, I was like, I feel exactly the same. And I remember my wife, all the insecurities that I had were still there, okay? All the things that I was proud of about myself, even before I had the money, were still the only things I was proud of. And I realized, whoa, money can't touch how you feel about yourself. And if how you feel about yourself is the only thing that matters, then money doesn't matter. Now, money is powerful. Money is actually more powerful than people think, but it isn't what people have been told. Money won't change how you feel about yourself. Not at all. Money is the great facilitator and it lets you build things, create things, buy things. It, it is amazing. And that is why people chase money. But man, money will not solve any emotional problems that you have. So if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're insecure, money will not touch any of that. Tom, year one, year two in the business, year three, did you ever feel like you were going to get a, you were like borderline heart attack or did you ever feel like quitting? Did you ever feel like this is the end? Not even once. I felt like that before. Remember, I go into this because I quit. So Quest was structured to be fun in and of itself. The right question to ask is, what would I do and love every day, even if I were failing? People usually ask the other thing. If I knew I could succeed at anything, what would I do? Or if I knew that success was guaranteed, what would I do? I would say that's the wrong way to ask it because success is not guaranteed, but the struggle is. So what will you love every day, even if you're failing? And because of what we were doing with my mom and my sister, because it felt like a brotherhood, because my wife was there, it was like all these things. I was going to love this man, fighting for these people, hiring people that had felony convictions and showing them it doesn't matter who you are today. It only matters who you want to become. Like investing in that, investing in the people. It was fucking awesome. And so it didn't hurt that it was working like gangbusters. But like I said, for years, it wasn't like a big tangible financial reward. It was every day rolling up. And is this awesome? And it was awesome. And so in doing this again with impact theory, it's like, is it awesome? Is every day awesome? And of course, not every day is going to be awesome. There's overhead. But for the most part, and in fact, 
this is exactly what I would do with my life if I never had to think about money again, right? I am, I have, I've had all the success that I ever need to worry about. I had a number in my head and I'm like, if I hit that number, I will never do anything for money ever again. I've hit that number. It's like, it, <laughs> it's still hard fucking work, but yeah. doing hard things is part of the physics of being human. That's what is so joyful. Do you feel, I see you having a perfect life right now, like perfect, like you're, you have, you have a perfect wife, you have a lot of money in the bank and, and you're teaching, which you love. You're creating content to help people. Keeps you busy. Uh, I don't see any, like you work out, you look healthy, good looking guy. Like, like what, what is missing in Tom's life? Are, do you have the perfect life right now? Um, it, it would be misleading to say yes, because part of what I think is the perfect life is being in alignment with the physics of being a human. So by nature, the human animal is active. So we don't want to just sit back. Um, I wouldn't have been happy retiring to an island. It's very fun to take a vacation, man. Everybody knows that. Yeah. But to do that forever, it, it isn't in alignment with the human condition. So part of what makes my life perfect, it feels weird to, to say that word. So it, it, it isn't aligned with how I feel about my actual life. But the pursuit of optimizing and making things better is in that sense, perfect. So there are things that about my life that I'm frustrated by because I'm trying to build something and it's so hard and I don't have the skill set that I need yet. And I've got to keep building that. But the pursuit of that is the intoxicant. So that is the very thing that I love. But part of what I love is that there's friction and I'm fighting and it's hard. And there are days where I fail and I'm pissed, but it's like that that joie de vivre, that joy, joy for the fight, man. That's, that's the juice. Like yeah. the very thing that animates me, that gets me hopped up. I want to feel alive. And part of feeling alive is the struggle. So it's like cold showers suck, but taking a cold shower makes you feel good about yourself because it's a hard fucking thing that you do in service of something. So my life is not like if, if people hear me say it's perfect, they're going to think that it, I feel good all the time, which is absolutely false. I feel like I'm fighting for my fucking life because I've set a goal that is so hard and so far away that it is almost certain that I will fail. But I believe in it so much that showing up every day to fight for it and to slog through the stress and the anxiety and the joys and the failures and like, that's the juice. Yeah. Awesome, Tom. I want to leave this with a one last question. Uh, building that billion dollar company, do you believe in investing back into the company and not taking some money out? It, is, it was key to build that billion dollar company, pumping back the money in? That's physics. Yeah, yeah. It is the only way. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we could do like a whole nother podcast about the realities of business, um, which I think people are, are terrifyingly blind to. Um, but for sure, we reinvested the money, um, having the beat up car, paying employees way more than I was making. Like right now, we've, we've been building Impact Theory for four years. Lisa and I haven't taken a dime in salary. So it's like, you, you just, because we want to keep putting it back into the company. Obviously, we don't need the money. So it's like, we'd rather reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. Um, and that is part of why you better love what you're doing. But then also, man, I'm, I'm realistic. I'm super glad that I ended up taking money off the table. So it was like, you, you have to time it right. Um, but I wouldn't want to be all investment and never reaping the rewards. So finding a way to know, invest, 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 and then find a way to take some off. So part of the reason that we sold a small piece of the company in the beginning was I wanted to know, we, we always knew we're one like salmonella outbreak from the company going out of business. Yeah. So it was like, oh God, let's sell a small piece. And if we only ever have that to show for it, like it was a victory, a huge victory. And obviously that didn't end up being the case. And we ended up fully exiting the company. It was fucking transform, transformational yet again. Um, yeah. But I was very glad that we took some money off when we did. Uh, and then obviously the final exit was, it was just gravy on top. And, and if you don't have to sell a piece, do you recommend don't sell it until you absolutely have to sell a piece. Now this, this, you need to know what you're doing. Are you building a company to hold like impact theory? I have exactly zero interest in selling. Okay. Um, but quest was built to last. So we didn't build it to sell it. In fact, for many years, I didn't think I would sell. I didn't think I would exit. Um, and so some of my views on that are looking backwards. Cause at the time it was just like, keep going, keep going, keep going. And, people need to 
One, always build a company for value creation. Don't build it to sell. Even if you know you want to sell, you just won't make the right moves unless you're building it to create value for your customer, for whatever shareholders you have. Just build it for value creation. And then if you want to exit it, by all means, but don't make the moves for the exit. Make the moves to build a really robust company that will survive long after you're gone. Um, but know what you want, right? So if the moment presents itself, then you can take it. And I've had a lot of entrepreneurs ask, you know, should I sell? And my answer is always the same. If you're asking whether you should sell, the answer is yes. And if, if there is a, a great opportunity, take it, man. You will be shocked how hard it is to, like if, if you've got a lot of momentum behind you and a valuation that you're excited about, take it, right? So you, nothing is guaranteed in the future. And if you can get something now and that feels like a total win for you, do it. But if you're like, but I don't want to sell, I want to do this forever, then do it forever. And if you fail, so what? Like you gave it your all, you ran it till the fucking wheels fell off, which is how I feel about impact theory. It's like, I'll run this motherfucker into the ground. I yeah. just want to, I want it to be my day-to-day -day existence. Yeah. Awesome, Tom. I want to respect your time. I want to really thank you for this and all the valuable information you shared to people. Impact theory, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I watch all your episodes and uh, I, I just love all the stuff you do to help people. Like uh, you have a good heart and uh, me and my wife uh, are your biggest fans. And uh, you want to say hi really quick? And uh, Tom, where could uh, people follow you? What's your favorite platform so people can, we'll put it in the link below. YouTube for sure, at Tom Bilyeu. Hello. How are you? You sound exactly like my wife. So I am, I am very excited that you guys have that kind of cool partnership. It's wonderful Great. to meet you. Yeah, and we love all your stuff, by the way. This guy can't live without your cookies. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mwah, awesome, nice Tom. You. So I'm going to put... Uh, nice I'm going to put the link below the, your information so people can uh, subscribe to your YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And uh, it's been a, a great uh, interview. Thank, thank you. Thanks, man. It was wonderful to meet you.